Hello, and welcome to this edition of Cold Chain Council webinar series. Our theme for today is how to collaborate with CMOs and boost efficiency and overcome capacity challenges in a complex supply chain. My name is Kevin Lynch. I am Director of Sales with Cube Products and Services, your proud host for all Cold Chain Council events. For a little bit of background on Cold Chain Council, back in 2016, Q Products and Services kicked off this uh, workshop style platform uh, that allows food and pharmaceutical professionals to gather, connect, and discuss ongoing challenges in their respective worlds and share best practices and talk about new emerging technologies that are being adopted in the cold chain. And it's been a successful venture for us thus far. And like everyone out there today, uh, we were forced into changing. And while a webinar series certainly does not replace a live event like that, it at least gives us an opportunity to share some thought leadership content with each of you today. And so for that, we're, we're grateful. And, and any kind of industry event doesn't take place without thought leaders, uh, such as those who are joining me here today. So uh, it's my pleasure and I'm honored to welcome with us our speakers for today, uh, beginning with Louise Barbardini with Bayer, who is the operations manager and external uh, manufacturing uh, lead in Latin America, and Jeff Tucker, who is the CEO of Tucker Worldwide. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Well, it's great to have you here today. And uh, for anyone who isn't familiar with Louise and Jeff, um, please do check out their bios. They are, uh, have a wealth of knowledge and experience in the healthcare and transportation space, among other segments. And uh, they are advocates for speaking at events like this and sharing their experiences, and, and we're grateful for that. Um, one of the overarching messages that they're gonna be talking about today is the importance of building strong relationships with your business partners and maintaining them as well. And if, if there was ever a year where that message was important, it's certainly 2020 where seemingly everybody's supply chains were turned upside down. So I think you're going to enjoy what they have to offer today and um, in the conversation that they're going to share. Before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, we have a format that allows both Louise and Jeff to uh, give a presentation. Uh, we have built in time for Q&A as well. So please do submit questions. And if you'd be so kind, please mention which speaker that question is targeted to. And if it's both, mention that as well. Uh, we do have um, a fireside chat planned at the end of the discussion, which will be exciting. And Luis and Jeff will be joining me for that as well. Uh, few housekeeping, last housekeeping note is that Luis's presentation is pre-recorded. Although, as you can see, he is joining us live today and he wanted to be here to answer your questions as well as join Jeff for the fireside chat. So at this time, we're going to start and kick things off with Louise's presentation, and then he'll join me back live for a few questions and answers. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know exactly what time is that in your time zone, but uh, Thank you very much to, for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to join you and to be with you uh, speaking about on how Bayer manages uh, their CMOs and how uh, do we try to get the best of our relationship. So today uh, I'll be talking about collaboration, co uh, collaborating with CMOs for increased efficiency and capacity in a very complex scenario, right? The, we'll go through some points like partner with CMOs to promote innovation, to utilize lean and continuous improvement concepts to drive efficiency, how to get alignment with your CMOs, and I will give some takeaways and tips that I do believe that you can use in your business. But ultimately, my objective here today is to share our example uh, and our experience targeting to make your life easier and the way that you manage your suppliers, okay? I do hope that our concepts can help you, right? Well, just start with some of my background. Um, I've worked for these companies right here uh, for the last 30 years. 
uh, in different areas like logistics, manufacturing, planning, demand planning, procurement, and a huge experience on the cold chain distribution uh, here in a continental countryside like Brazil, right? Very challenging place to do logistics, right? And uh, nowadays I'm working for Bayer with external manufacturing uh, based in, in US, right? But I'm still in Sao Paulo in Brazil, okay? Today uh, I'm planning to go through this point here, innovation and partnership, uh, some comments on lean continuous improvement and in industry 4.0, uh, about CMO alignment and capacity and some takeaways, okay? So just to start, uh, I'd like to say that today I'm feeling like this. Actually, you are feeling like this, the same. You name it, we are feeling in very, uh, we are feeling like this in this very complex world, right? We, we may say that we are feeling hesitant, we are feeling incapable, we are feeling afraid, the process. We've been working uh, through home office, most of us, for the last five months. It's a huge time to, to change the way that we do our business, the way that we relate to our CMOs, the way that we keep our relationship moving. It's a very complex situation, right? I do believe that many of you have heard of this before. We live in a, uh, in a very complex world with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. But even more difficult, nowadays we are living in a clumsy world, in an outless world, huge volatility, right? Huge indecisity in this world. And very unfortunately, it's a deadly world. So long story short, we can say that we move it from a VUCA world uh, in this, that probably you've heard of this before, to a COVID world, okay? It's a very complex situation. We are trying to, to learn how to work again in this scenario, right? So in such a challenging scenario, it's important to have the right partnership and look for innovation. But to start this discussion, the first commandment that I have here is that one partner must share the customer's focus. And this is something important to say. Let's take this picture as an example. One may say that we have four bars. The other may say that we have three bars. It's a, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of how do you see the, 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 the problems or the things. You can have your focus on your customer or you can share your customer's focus. This is the point that I like to to, to mention and to make sure that we are all speaking the same language. So focus on the customer is about to fulfill customers' needs for products and services, right? But when one uh, uh, has the customer's focus, they share their customer's vision as well or, or even better than themselves. But in other words, we have something like this. Uh, when you focus on your customer and you are hungry, you go to a restaurant or a fast food, you get some products and services. They'll give you some food and that's okay, right? They'll be delivering it to you, it's nice. But when you go to a restaurant, when they have the customer's focus, it's a kind of going to a chef. He knows what you want to eat. He knows uh, exactly what kind of food you'll be willing at, at that day. Okay, so it's a very uh, uh, different approach that we have here. And we do must strive for a company and a partner that share our focus, that share the customer's focus, right? Here is where we have innovation. When someone really understands you, understands your business and wants to work with you. So if you're striving for innovation, you must have someone that share your focus right, that shares your vision, okay? And of course, it's not easy. So can you imagine, Bayer is going to outsource R&D. This is from 2018. And when Bayer starts to, to looking for this situation, we are looking for partners to work and to, to 
outsource R&D. This is a core business for a pharmaceutical company, and we are looking to that, right? And of course, you must keep the final user in mind. So when you sell some kind of choice to these clients, they go over there and buy this. Finally, the final user sees this thing, right? This is the perspective that they have. So it's very important to have all the visions uh, in place. So my first tip, tip here is have someone that shared the customer focus, right? When we go through some discussions on lean continuous improvement and industry 4.0, of course, we have to start talking about digitization and we go to digital transformation. Many of us are discussing these topics right now, right? So my first question, is digitization a recent concept? Is something new? Not all that new. It has first started when Soviet Union had their first atomic bomb. Wow, long time ago, isn't it? Yeah, it is. What was happening in the world at the same time? Uh, we, the NATO has been established. We had German, uh, the, the Federal Republic of Germany founded and some other points. It was very long ago. When? Well, you might be surprised, but it has started with this machine. And probably none of you know that, but this is an IBM 26 printing card punch introduced in July 1949. So we started talking about digital work back in 1949. This was the first attempt to change information from analog to digital, right? And we've talking about this for 70 years, right? And many companies are still saying, okay, what we have to do in this digital world? Okay, so it's interesting to get this perspective. At Bayer, our strategy houses something like this. We build self-care, right? We rely on people and culture, customer and consumer value, all these four pillars over here. But in between these pillars, we have these concepts that are very important. So product supply systems, digitalized operations, and network optimization. So my my speech here today goes really about digitalized operations and optimize your, our network, right? When some company wants to navigate on the 4.0C, you have many building blocks. You know about that. I'm not going through any details, right? We have simulation, augmented reality, cybersecurity, many, many topics like this. It's very, very important. But we also must rely on someone. Right. Uh, the industry 4.0 is about process and information, but must rely on people to define process, establish its connections, and properly govern and manage all the systems. Right. So please keep one eye on the industry 4.0, right, to navigate on the sea, but also look for the right people. And we talk about people, this image comes to my mind. You remember this film from Charlie Chaplin? What was happening, what had happened uh, at that company with the technology that they had uh, by that time? People get, just got crazy. So when you talk about navigation, please consider the sailors that you, you're going to use, right? Very important to, keep, to, keep, to pay attention on the people, okay? So to navigate the supply chain of the future will be smarted, connected, a self-learning process and must, uh, uh, must agile. It must be something like this for the future. But of course, think digital, but have the best sailors on board. Be resilient. The word that we can use here is resilience, but you also need to focus on the sailors that you'll be using, okay? Um, going through some discussions on CMO alignment and capacity discussions. In a very clear basic discussion, manage your business and relationship with transparency, honesty, and sincere collaboration. This is what we really try to do at Bayer. We try to be very honest and transparent with our suppliers and be very collaborative with them. In fact, we have some concepts that help us in going through this, right? And um, 
we can uh, we will go through that uh, in the sequence but when you have clear discussions with your suppliers you can discuss the capacity that is something that's really uh, sensible to us when a company says okay i'm hiring a cmo we will, will i have enough capacity for the future so we can have discussions like this the available to promise that they can that they can provide you uh, some competitors sharing same production lines technology time fences uh, and on-time deliver right so this is a very uh, complex situation that we might have i'm very sorry you can hear my dogs barking at the background right i'll be transparent i'll be very honest and they'll collaborate with you i try to avoid this at the maximum but someone doing some noise uh, in the back door okay okay let's move forward my external manufacturing nightmare we shall produce to other company okay can I we go to other companies can we produce somewhere else I do believe we can right so just a, a point of do the business in a correct way in order to do that, uh, Bayer rely on some key relationship factors that I'll go through some of them right now. Okay. First of all, probably a few of you might have heard of this before. It's bacon and eggs, right? So what uh, I mean when I talk about bacon and eggs, when you ask for a, uh, in your breakfast for bacon and eggs, the chicken is involved, but the pork is committed. So this is very important. What kind of relationship do you expect from your suppliers? You expect that someone to be involved with or someone that's committed to your business? And this goes back to that discussion on the customer's focus. Are they sharing the same focus that you have? Right? So this is the very first concept that must be very clear and you have to pay attention on that. The second key relationship factor that I used to mention, it's about the paddle ball game. Remember, I live in Brazil, we have nice beaches and we do love to play paddle ball at the beach. We spend hours doing that, right? So what's about playing paddle ball? It's to give, uh, to keep the ball in the air. I can give good balls to my partner and they give good balls for us. And then when one gives a good ball, odds are that you, they will get good balls back. So this is the point. When you send good balls, odds that, uh, are that you will get them back do you play paddle ball with your cmos with your with your partners with your third pls with your temperature controlled devices supplier do you give them enough information uh, enough uh, details on your process so they can do their best and give you good balls this is the very important point that i like to 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 mention here right it's important to have this kind of approach. You have to do your best so they can do their best. Many companies uh, until today says and claims that, okay, this is not my, my, my problem. It's my supplier's problem. No, it's your problem. It's on the hands of your supplier, but it's your problem. If you don't do that correctly, they can't do their best. This is the point, right? So, uh, the tip that I can give you here is keep the commitment, share your data and send good balls, right? This is mandatory if you really want a CMO to work with you. Going through my final comments, uh, I would say that from Simon Sinek, 100% of customers of people, 100% of employees are people. If you don't understand people, you don't understand business. So please take into account that your CMOs, your third PLs, your fourth PLs, uh, your suppliers, they are people. Give them all the respect that they deserve, right? It's imperative. This is very, very important. We are all individuals, but we are all the same. We are the same people, okay? So just to close this topic here, my final comments. Um, at Bayer's, uh, these are the valid behaviors that we have. Customer focus, experimentation, collaboration, and trust. This is what we want to can expect it from someone from Bayer. But I would just add the tips that I've mentioned here, right? Have someone that share the customer's focus, have a, a CMO or a device supplier that works with you. Think digital, 
but have the best sailors on board, right? Keep the commitment, share your data, and send good balls. This is very, very important. And of course, we are all people fighting the same battles and facing the same risks. COVID is here. We all know that we are on the same boat, right? So just to close my discussion here today, and uh, this is my last message, right? Uh, of course, very important one to, to know, okay? And uh, I do hope that you enjoyed these few minutes in spite of the dogs barking, right? And I do hope to see you again next year probably, okay? Thank you very much uh, for being here and to your interest in getting to know what Bayer is doing, okay? Thank you very much. Welcome back, Luis. Thank you, Kevin. So what I really liked about your presentation is that, and enjoyed about it, is that uh, a lot of the lessons you shared, they weren't limited to CMOs. They're not specific to actual, uh, you know, healthcare industry. And you shared some real, real candid insights that can and probably should be applied to a lot of different uh, business partnerships. So uh, really, really well done in that presentation. Appreciate that. Yeah, so in fact, uh, I used to mention CMOs, but it's valid for any supplier that's very close to you. Third PLs, four PLs, right? And, and other ones like that, okay? Absolutely. So we have we have a few minutes for some Q&A, so I, I can fire off a question at you right here. You spoke a lot about trust, a lot about collaboration. You know, you have a new CMO in your network. How do you go about building that trust and encouraging sincere collaboration? Yeah, uh, very nice question indeed. Uh, I would say in a, in a very uh, concise way that you have to be present and close to your to your partner, to your CMO, to your third PL. You have to visit them to know their processes, to know their people, to know how they work, right? And since we start establishing some connections and some relationship with these other company, this will move to people to people. Uh, relationship and, and, and contact and you have to start building this this uh, trustful relationship first of all between companies and then between the people that you're engaging with. Thank you. Very nice, thank you. How does Bayer go about uh, evaluating performance with CMOs during these you know very unique COVID times? Yeah, yeah, uh, COVID has been a challenge for all of us. Right. But we, uh, first of all, we had our uh, a very nice risk mitigation plan in, pros, in, in place, right? And we followed this plan, uh, defining what are the risks that each supplier is facing, how are uh, their uh, situations, how things are going in different countries. Uh, with that in mind, we could be able to keep tracking on their performance and checking what they were uh, in need, I would say. So we had a very good result of this uh, of this plan in place, and we got a very good communication. We suffered very little from lack of supply or for some problems from our CMOs. Right? They were very transparent. They were very clear, and we have a very honest uh, discussion on what are the bottlenecks, what are the problems that they were facing kind of exports from China and, and India that had affected them, right? But uh, keeping this this contact and this discussion, we, we succeeded in, very, in having a very good result during all this period. We got no uh, product loss of sales during all this month, right? And we were uh, able to keep a uh, 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 reliable and complete supply. Okay. Very good. Well, well, thank you very much, Louise. And uh, if you want to stick around, we'd like to bring you back for a little conversation with Jeff later on. Um, at this time, we're going to bring Jeff back into the loop and um, welcome him into the conversation. So, Jeff, we, we heard uh, Louise talk a lot about words and the importance of communication and collaboration, transparency, trust. 
I would imagine that in your world of transportation, those uh, those terms are very important and very relevant. Yeah, they are. And I thought Luis did a, a fine job of, of um, illustrating how a large company like Bayer can be nimble, uh, can avail itself to the resources it needs during the most challenging times. I think Excellent. that that um, that example, um, as, as as I think you said, uh, uh, applies to you know virtually every kind of business. Okay. Certainly applies in transportation. Okay. All right, Jeff. Well, you've got the keys to the car. Look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay. Thanks. So. Uh, this is just kind of an overview of what I intend to uh, cover here in the next uh, in the next few minutes. But uh, just very quickly, my background here is that uh, Tucker is a non-asset based uh, third party logistics company, the oldest privately held freight brokerage in the country. I'm third generation in the business. So we don't own any trucks, but we move a lot in the area of healthcare and food. So uh, a lot of life science, uh, Manufacturers are, are customers of ours, and, uh, and then we support even, um, uh, you might say it in the wholesale uh, sort of way, working with uh, providers like uh, uh, QSales or, or the forwarders who specialize in this particular uh, business. So a lot of temp control. So uh, very quickly, what I intend to do is uh, step you through what's happening in the market today. It's, it's, it's been quite a ride. As, as many of you already know. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a case study of two shippers and competing on the same shelves in the same marketplaces. We've got a number of um, uh, competitors in, in various different spaces where we can kind of see how they go at it differently and how, how uh, some are transactional in their thinking and, and end up with very transactional relationships and, and then some are far more strategic in their thinking and, and and uh, as, as uh, Luis illustrated, get tremendous value uh, from, from their partnerships. And, and, I'll, I'll, you know, and that kind of leads in to where I intend to, 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 to finish up is just kind of give folks some ideas as to what that looks like, at least with regard to transportation, uh, which is my, clearly my area of, uh, of interest and experience. So um, I, I uh, created this, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, it seemed to be, uh, you know, the five stages of grief, uh, but transportation version. And uh, it really, it just sort of depends on where you are in the marketplace and who you are in the market. So uh, you might feel this way if you're a carrier in a down market, and you're going to certainly feel this way as a shipper or a buyer like myself in an um, in, in up market like we're in. But obviously, uh, this is, uh, we'll talk about the buyer's perspective. Uh, uh, you know, the first thing is uh, you start to understand, oh, what the heck is going on? How come, uh, how, come I'm losing, how come I'm losing the ability to move freight? What's going on? Uh, just pick up the freight, you know? And, uh, and then it becomes anger. Like you start to see it more frequently, more often, and you start looking around and, and really getting angry. Um, and, uh, and, and the threats. I'm done with you. I'm moving on. Uh, then you move to the the bargaining. Once you realize, okay, there's really like something's going on here. Okay, listen, I didn't really mean that. Uh, let's be friends and let's see if we can't work something out. And I think that where we are right now in the marketplace is somewhere between bargaining and acceptance. Uh, you know, depression <laughs> clearly sets in. And my goodness, 2020 has been a year uh, that um, you know I think. You know, all joking aside, a lot of us are, are dealing with uh, a lot of um, uh, you know challenges, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's depression or just flat out uh, uh, business challenges. But uh, you know, gosh, how am I going to explain this one? I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, we're blowing the budget, and then acceptance is hey, look, this again, a little tongue in cheek. There's no coming back from this one. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, next time we'll be better prepared. And I, wa I want to give um, an opportunity to anyone who's a buyer, or really, you know, if you're on the other side of this, the next downturn. If you're, I, I want to give the opportunity for all of us to be thinking about how do we stop this from becoming a cycle? How do we? Because I, I can tell you, in my 30 years in this industry, 
I've seen the same companies make the same mistakes every single time, and I'll tell you when they're gonna make them. I can't predict the timing, but I can tell you the timing of the marketplace, when they're gonna make them, what they're gonna say, and how they're gonna end up. So what I'd like to do is take those years of experience and share that a little bit today so that we can avoid that cycle. So um, <laughs> this is, I, I've been talking quite a bit uh, this, uh, this year, uh, probably more than I've ever talked about the marketplace and the industry. And, uh, and gosh, we're only in uh, beginning of October, not even. And it, it occurred to me a few weeks back, and I was a history major, economics minor, and I, I got my MBA after, afterwards. So I, I have a lot of history uh, behind me. And I, I think about history quite often, and economics is part of understanding you know, business history trend. Um, it feels as if, in a lot of ways, at least with regard to freight transportation, we've just experienced, you know, about a century of American history. And what I mean by that, you know, you can kind of look at January and February, we're, they're not even, you know, just kind of like regular um, markets, you know, uh, maybe, maybe the shippers had a slight upper hand because, uh, you know, most of 2019, if we can even remember back, to the olden days of 2019, we know that uh, the the heyday of 2018, the capacity crisis of 2018, sort of mellowed out, and that's really how we entered 2020. Big question as to how that was going to shake out. Well, um, you know, March um, we got a sense of what it might have been like, and we're still dealing with it today. What it might have been like during the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918. Now you see a a dotted line that crosses this chart. And the dotted line, uh, I'm gonna show you in just a second, but the dotted line is uh, the demand for trucking through this stages of history. Early, uh, uh, early of April, early April uh, was uh, at least for trucking, maybe the roaring uh, 20s. Um, there were a lot of toilet paper loads, paper towel loads, um, everything that we we felt that we needed unlimited uh, supplies of at home to sustain, um, you know, COVID. Uh, that really bur uh, uh, really uh, helped trucking out uh, for maybe two to three weeks, and then all of a sudden, boom! Uh, you might remember uh, late April, May. You, uh, truckers were parked out in front of the White House or as close as they could with their trucks to the White House and complaining that uh, they needed regulation help and they needed rates to increase and this and that. Um, and and, and um, rates, that, the bottom of that line that you see, that dotted line that's uh, in the April, May uh, area, rates reached the lowest point in, in demand for trucking, reached the lowest point in, um, in recorded history. And then you can see what happens after. Um, I, I call July and August uh, a composition of the four capacity crises in the last 30 years. Um, it's kind of a Frankenstein of capacity crises. And then, of course, the present right now, we're, we'll talk about in just a second, is pretty um, uh, uncertain, obviously, because we don't know what is going to be ahead of us um, day to day, let alone month to month but we're at uh, pretty historic highs at the moment. In fact, um, this is data from Freight Waves, uh, their sonar product, provides a lot of different insight. This insight here is, uh, you'll see the green uh, image on the, on the icon on the right is 24.97, or essentially 25% of all loads are being rejected, uh, excuse me, 25% of tenders from shipper TMS systems are being rejected by the number one um, uh, recipient, uh, would be that carrier broker. That's one in four, and I, that might be a record. I've never, I don't recall. I mean, this is a fairly new data, but uh, it's extraordinarily high, uh, painfully high. And uh, you can see it, it started in July, and uh, it's uh, it's been up there for, for quite some time. So extraordinary changes and, and, and challenge. And, and this you can see here, 
this goes back to uh, last year. So let's uh, let's go middle part of the chart is where you see uh, weeks uh, two, four, six. That's the beginning of this year. And you can see that same effect that the demand I was referring to just a moment ago. You can see that happen here in prices. So demand, again, uh, spiked a little bit in weeks 10, 12, 13 due to the toilet paper uh, rush. And... Um, and then of course uh, dropped precipitously. Uh, and uh, as I said, demand demand hasn't been that low in recorded history. Morgan Stanley runs a uh, study that looks back to uh, early 2000s, and there's nothing nothing close to it. Uh, and and then uh, you know 20 or so straight weeks of extraordinarily high increase in pricing. So, um, but I'll tell you that. Uh, my experience in this industry uh, will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll also we'll, we'll, we'll talk on. Uh, there are things that you can do to anticipate this. And I think that uh, we're, um, we're at that place now where uh, it's maybe a little bit too late to change your culture. Um, uh, but uh, it's time at, at, at this stage to, to awaken, if you haven't already, to awaken and begin to change that culture, um, because if if there's one thing that's certain is that uh, I mentioned I've got I got the 30 years in the industry, right? So in the in the uh, deregulation happened in 1980, so that's over 30 years ago, uh, and uh, in that time, the first capacity crisis that ever hit since 1980 was um, 2003. So 23 years it took for a capacity crisis to hit. And then another one didn't happen for another decade after that. But the second, the third, and the fourth capacity crises to hit in that period of time since 1980, 40 years, uh, three of them happened in the last six years. So while we could never have predicted, at least those of us not in government and, and infectious disease, <laughs> Uh, could never have predicted this year and, and, and the impact. What we can look back and see is that the pace of change is happening so rapidly that we absolutely positively have to be anticipating it. And we've got to build supply chains that are durable enough and resilient enough to anticipate this change. And I present to you, and I, I, I will um, I'll look anyone, any procurement person, any transportation person in, in, in the eye uh, in, in America to challenge me, uh, to, to challenge them to say that they are not, for the most part, not building resilient supply chains. I've got customers who've got outstanding resilient supply chains where they're only rejecting maybe four or excuse me, their tender rejections are maybe four or 5% and they're angry about that, right? That Those are extraordinary uh, performers. Uh, those ones at 25%, guess what? There's a whole bunch of folks less than 25% to bring that average to 25%. So there are needs to be a change in the way we think about our partners. And, and uh, Luis's presentation was just absolutely outstanding. And I think it leads to what those things are. I, I won't mention this, this is cold chain council. And I've been on several uh, sessions recently as, a, as an attendee or as a, as a, as a presenter. And I, uh, I will not pretend to be an expert in how many 747s worth of cargo space uh, are gonna be required to move this COVID vaccine. But I'll tell you, and I think the, stating the obvious, there's never been a, a logistics effort in the world, anything close to what we have to, to do. And incidentally, we've got to do it extremely cold. And I just shared with you the slides indicating how tight capacity is right now. And you've got to ask yourself, wait a second, if capacity is that tight and I ship temp control, I don't even have to be part of that, that, uh, uh, that airlift, that truck move, that, that distribution, that supply chain of, of COVID vaccine to be thinking, oh man, <laughs> um, I've got to be thinking about this. I've got to be thinking about how are my products going to get to market when 
you know, IATA's uh, 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 president a few weeks ago indicated 8,747. Well, all that stuff has to move by truck. All that stuff has to move extremely cold. And negative 20 and below, the only thing that moves at that uh, temperature regularly enough, in sufficient quantity enough, is ice cream. Yeah, look, I get it. Temp control, or excuse me, that, that temperature moves by other pharmaceuticals from time to time, but not in any kind of quantity. Uh, so where's this gonna come from? Dry ice, packaging companies, um, other engineering feats of uh, marble. But um, if you have anything to do with temp control, uh, anything at all, um, you've gotta be thinking about what is this humanitarian effort that we need to get accomplished. Um, what is this gonna do to my supply chain? And you've gotta be prepared because that's probably capacity crisis number five. And I'm not sure anyone's gonna get away from uh, that uh, pinching their supply chain. So uh, this is one of the areas that I really wanna focus on as, I, as, as we need to be thinking differently. I think shippers uh, will often say, hey, uh, you know, we're big, we like to deal with big. And um, that just couldn't be further from the reality on the road. Um, if you are, if you're, if you're a big company, yeah, you, you know, there's some big trucking companies out there and you can take a look here, but this is where the drivers are. The drivers are in those small fleets, the, the, the one to a hundred um, truck fleets. And there ain't no way a shipper uh, without, you know, use of forwarders and brokers to bring that capacity to, 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 to bear, ain't no way a shipper's gonna get that capacity. Ain't no way a shipper's gonna get uh, access to that. And that's where most of the drivers are. I mean, you combine uh, drivers one to 100 that you still don't get the uh, one to 100 truck fleets. You still don't get um, a total of all other fleet sizes combined. The problem is uh, that's, not a, that's not moving in the big, big carrier's favor. It's actually getting worse for the big carriers. This is a very, very busy slide, I give you that. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to make this slide available to folks, but um, over the last uh, eight years, we've had a, uh, a driver count of one to 19 trucks has increased 807,000, uh, sorry, uh, increased 390,000 to a total of 807,000 extraordinary growth. All you hear, and even in colleges, uh, professors talk about this because all they get is their data from the ATA and, 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 and media, which gets its data from the ATA, is a driver shortage. And, and there is a tremendous driver shortage. It's in those uh, large fleets. The, there is a surge of drivers uh, that have entered the marketplace, nearly a million in about a decade, but they're not driving for those large fleets. So you can't. Uh, no matter how big you are, you can't deal with big and somehow have capacity. You need them absolutely positively, but you've got to be thinking differently. So how do you think differently? How do you break this cycle? That's really what I want to focus on. This is a little, little case study. I, I've got numerous uh, examples, but, you know, um, again, back to Luis's point, um, you know, do you want to be <laughs> invested like the pork? Uh, or, or casually involved uh, like chicken. And uh, I, think I, I think I butchered that, sorry, uh, Luis. But, um, you know, I've got, I've got uh, an example here of, you know, from a transportation provider perspective, we'll have a QBR with, uh, with this one client and they'll involve transportation people, distribution people, planning people, their third party warehousing company, um, Security sometimes, I'm try to think. That's, uh, it, but you, you get the sense, right? Uh, you get the sense of, uh, and then there's usually a, a senior level uh, or middle senior level manager involved as well in a couple of those areas. Uh, during our QBRs, we share a lot of data. And um, I think every everyone knows the example of when you've got a, uh, when you've got a, uh, a meeting where you're, you're having a meeting with one one group of people, right? Uh, and, and and then when you've got a meeting with all the stakeholders, this is one of those meetings with all the stakeholders. So you 
these these meetings have evolved where you've got um, you've got action items from the last QBR that each group has been working on together. You can't point the fingers. Previously, we were able to say, oh, well, that's the warehouse's problem because X, Y, and Z, and they don't do this and they don't do that. And the warehouse would point at us and, and uh, you know, at what, what happens is you never really get the whole story, right? So, so um, these customers that, uh, that, that bring those stakeholders together and, um, and really begin to understand the issues and work on those issues collaboratively and understand that you know it's, it's going to take a little bit from each one of us to make this thing work. Those are extraordinarily uh, durable supply chains, extraordinarily effective um, in terms of getting communication back into the organization. If planners know the, the loads are going to be available and they know the capacity's uh, uh, tight and there's a way to maybe shrink that window, incredibly uh, valuable and important, uh, I've got the uh, you know customer two in this example. You meet with the transportation people and the transportation people only. Right? And you have your QBR and, and you've got your opportunities for improvement that you're that you're bringing. You've got your data, but you don't have the planners. Let's say you don't have the third party warehouse. You don't have um, the stakeholders from the various different groups. And and what happens there is very oftentimes. Uh, you know, after the QBR is over, everyone goes back to the desks, right? Everyone knows this feeling. Uh, and uh, sometimes things change, sometimes they don't. And you don't have the opportunity to flex. You don't have to, the opportunity to be nimble like Luis's example laid out pretty clearly. And, and I've seen some of the largest companies grow to be quite nimble and, uh, and especially nimble as compared to client or, you know, companies in their same space. By taking this customer one approach, by taking that vested approach that Luis got into. And I, I, I'll tell you just one quick uh, takeaway here is, as a company that is a high service provider like, like we are, when our team sees that one of the suggestions for improvement has been adopted, that builds this this great sense of pride in them, and they're looking for more. So that's just like one, maybe tiny example of, of the value that uh, these kinds of relationships uh, throw off. And it's, it's really hard to quantify, but I see it every day uh, in my company. Some of the things that are really important as I wrap up um, today, and, and um, you know, I, these are these are things I've gotten used to through the years. I've gotten used to this notion of shipper of choice, uh, or how, you know, how do I become an attractive shipper? How do I do the things that make uh, my company more interesting, more productive um, to, to to do business with? And and um, these are some of those things. Uh, but what what I'll what I'll mention, what I'll caution is, we try to build this into all of our customers, regardless of the marketplace, we try to share this information, whether it's a hot marketplace like now, where you really need to be one of these kinds of shippers, or whether it's a softer marketplace where you've got abundant capacity and you really don't care. I shouldn't say that, but that's the way so many different companies believe uh, they go at it. They really don't care when things are soft. And I think you really, in order to build that, build that resilient supply chain, that, redund that, that, that redundant supply chain where you've got additional capacity and you can scale and you can withstand the, the, the frequency at which massive change is happening in this marketplace, um, you've got to make it a cultural change. And these are some of the areas. Uh, you know, I'll, I won't go in too deep into this because I think we'd like to get into fireside chat, but again, these are some of the areas and, and this slide will be made available. But, you know, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples, especially during COVID, uh, these restrooms, uh, I've got to have to have restrooms for drivers, uh, whether that even just order some porta potties, porta johns, that these folks are human beings and they need to be treated treated well. Um, uh, Off-site parking, um, you know, all, all of these are, 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 are fairly important 
Um, I, I'd also like to just kind of go back to, and I recognize I, here I'm a non-asset based provider, and I, but I have to recognize too, I can't deal only with large asset based carriers, can possibly accommodate um, most of my customer requests if I do that. I've got to deal with small, medium, large and super sized carriers. And, uh, and I, I hear so many shippers during times of softness say these fatal, <laughs> mortal <laughs> words. Uh, yeah, well, we're going to uh, scale back the number of providers and we're gonna, tr we're gonna go asset based. And I, I will argue and uh, politely and diplomatically do with anyone who's taken that approach, that that approach is the approach that gets you in trouble, that creates brittle supply chains and it completely ignores the fact that those large carriers are in massive driver shortage and there is a massive movement afoot toward the smaller medium-sized uh, carriers where drivers feel a little bit more empowered and important. So I think in the end, you've got to be thinking about when you're constructing relationships, you've got to be thinking about performance and not um, asset versus non-asset. I mean, yeah, you're going to have both of those in the mix. Ultimately, especially in tech control, especially retail, comes down to performance. Uh, I'm chairman of the National Industrial Transportation League. Uh, the website is right there, nitl.org. Knit League, I was in the room 10 years ago when Knit League uh, uh, coined, not 10 years ago, 20 something years ago, when Knit League coined the phrase shipper of choice. And we created this document uh, between uh, the Truckload Carrier Association and the National Industrial Transportation League, largest shipper organization. So I'm happy to share this resource with anyone who uh, you know reaches out uh, to us. Uh, but it gives you ideas on how exactly to build yourself and to be an attractive uh, transportation um, um, uh, partner as a shipper or a buyer. Kevin, thank you. And uh, folks, thank you very much for your, your attention. We're ready to go. All right, excellent. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. And we, we've got about a little under 10 minutes left. So we're going to uh, try to bring Louise back into the uh, ended up fold here and and ask um, uh, you and Jeff a few questions. Uh, nice presentation, Jeff. Appreciate your candid insights there. And um, I think that uh, a lot of what you said is needed to be heard, even though it may not want to be heard, but I think it was very important that you shared a lot of that. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Yeah, it, it's, uh, look, you know, I, I've been doing this long enough and I try not to be, um, <laughs> I try not to sugarcoat, I try to be plain English uh, as best I can. Uh, it's a delicate line since I am a service provider. Excellent, no, fair enough, duly noted. So a uh, few questions here. We'll start with Louise and we'll allow Jeff to respond to, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, building a vested relationship with a, with a supplier or a customer, at what point in that process do you know um, they're actually vested? And, and Louise, let's start with you and, and get your thoughts on that. Yep, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, Jeff, thank you for the presentation. Really nice one. Uh, I do hope that we can share a beer sometime, right? As soon as COVID is over. So I do believe that we have a lot of things to talk of, uh, through. And Kevin, I do believe that uh, an increase uh, or a steady service level would be a good metric for a good relationship status, right? So I would say that this is the ultimate number or ultimate KPI that you might consider uh, with that. If you have a CMO or a third PL, four PL that also shares uh, your thoughts and can anticipate your needs and demands, this is incredible, right? Going back to my presentation on the uh, sharing the customer's focus, they should share the same vision that I do. I think that when one supplier has this characteristic, it's a great one, okay? Excellent. Jeff, your thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I tend to agree. I think that, uh, you know, where I was saying earlier about our team, when I, when I know um, that we're in one, in a vested relationship, I, I, it's, it's clear as day. You know, we, 
our team is continually looking for opportunities of improvement. They're reporting them in to our account management team, our national account. We're going prepared with that information, the data in our QBRs. And, and uh, uh, you know, there, it's one thing when you deliver that information. It's a whole other thing when you deliver that information and you get feedback that, yeah, you know what? That's a good idea. We can't do it, however. We really like this one. When you get that feedback, that's that's a pretty dynamic um, experience that it comes back into our organization and there's motivation to, to find more. And, and it, it's hard to explain, uh, but you know it when you see it. Okay. No, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, let me let me flip that around a little bit, and Jeff, we can start with you. And I realize this may be a difficult thing to answer, so um, as best you can. How do you, you know, customers not vested? You know, what what does that mean in terms of the relationship? How is that how is that different uh, in, in your world? And then Luis will give you a chance to follow. Yeah, uh, it is hard. it is hard. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's a hard it's a hard question to answer, but. Uh, again, we're a service provider. We're high service, high end service provider. I suppose is, is really a better, a better phrase. And so every customer is going to get a, a pretty intensive level of service. Uh, it's just that the uh, it would seem again, just as I as I indicated just a, a moment ago, it would seem that uh, there is if 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 the customer is receptive to to um, to, to feedback on. You know, we 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 kind of feel as if we're behavioral um, uh, uh, organizational behaviorists, I suppose, is is the best way. And and if we get the feedback that that um, opportunities or data or observations are, uh, you know, are, are recognized and 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 taken, um, it, it just it means the world of difference. And and if not, you know, it's it's um, maybe those opportunities aren't, you know quite as ex, uh, exciting to bring back to the customer, I suppose, sure. hard, hard, to, hard to articulate. No, under, under, understood, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I totally second Jack on, on his thoughts, right? I, I think it's the same. And let me take just one example here. Um, we've been working with key products and services for, uh, for almost 10 years. They, they proven themselves as a rate, very reliable partner to our uh, coaching distribution all around the world, right? And they have this kind of, of, of uh, preoccupation or they are aware that we should spread the word on how Bayer works, right, to other, uh, to other customers. That's why they've invited us for uh, the, the coaching council, which I really thank them. But this is the kind of company that uh, wants to work with us. If some kind of movement like this doesn't happen, you have to start thinking, are they really interested in working with Bayer? Many companies are not interested in that. Although Bayer is a great company, big one, many companies, they work for Johnson & Johnson, for instance, for, for uh, uh, Pfizer or any other ones. And they say, hey guys, too much for us. We have to, I'm sorry, but I, I can't give you all the attention that you need, right? So uh, again, when a company get it's very honest and very transparent, they'll tell you, okay, I, I cannot invest, be invested in this relationship, right? So please check for some model that can serve you better than I can do. It's very hard to say that, but it might yeah. happen. Thank okay. you. And thank you for the kind words too, Louise. We appreciate it. As, as we wrap up here today, um, I'll leave you guys with a quick, maybe 30 seconds. Any lessons learned from this, uh, this um, where the, the you know, the unexpected has become the norm, so to speak, in this world of 2020 that you think uh, you'll take with you in your business long-term uh, well beyond 2020. Uh, Jeff, we'll start with you. I just think at least with regard to transportation, the the um, uh, digitization we touched on the, uh, and, and the speed at which we need products, consumer products and all products is changing transportation's complexion, changing its importance. And, uh, and and these these cycles, these wild cycles that we're going through the last six years will only accelerate and you've just got to be prepared and you've got to prepare your supply chains differently. Great points, yeah. Luis. Yeah, 2020 has proven itself as a, an year where companies just stop it and 
had to think about their strategies and what they were doing. We had plenty of time for that. So I do expect that 2021 on uh, will be uh, some time for implementing some changes, implementing some new strategies, and some companies will be better prepared to face some situations that we were not aware and not prepared. Right, right. So very complex to 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 predict what what will happen. But I do believe that it will be a time for implementation, implementing some changes. Well, excellent. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Jeff, Louise, really appreciate uh, not only your time today, but what you folks do for your industries. And uh, it's, uh, it's a good service you're providing and speaking events like this. That's our goal, to share some insightful and candid comments. And, and you've accomplished that today. So thank you very much for your time and attention uh, to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, there are some, some takeaways, um, any questions that went unanswered, we will share them with the speakers and allow them an opportunity to share some, some more insights and post webinar content. Uh, some additional webinar content that you can expect post, post today. Um, you will receive a recording of this webinar that you're welcome to share with any of your colleagues. Um, Jeff, the best practices guide that he had shared, he was kind enough to share That'll be available to you folks as well on the topic of shipper of choice. I think that's very important and relevant today as it was 20 years ago. Uh, and then you each get a survey immediately following this webinar. Your feedback is very important to us. So please do share, good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, we appreciate um, any feedback you can share with us. And if, if you'd be kind enough to, to share, share the word and spread the word a little bit and provide your support for Cold Chain Council, we want to continue to do these webinars. Please follow our group on LinkedIn and look out for our next webinar coming up in November. And other than that, be well, stay safe, and have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Bye.